Hello everyone and welcome to our second video into our analysis of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. So today we're going to dive into the first six stanzas of this famous poem together. Before we dive in then, just a few reminders. If you are all caught up and you have listened to the dramatic reading and you've downloaded the PDF copy of the poem, feel free to tune me out for a minute. You can enjoy the lovely Edgar Allan Poe themed cartoon to your right. But for those who have not, please give me your attention for a moment. You need to make sure before continuing this video that you listen to one of the dramatic readings that I've posted for you on a lesson. So you have several links to choose from, an actor of your choice, so just go ahead and click and listen to that. It's only about seven to eight minutes long. And then also do make sure that you go and download the PDF copy of the poem because you will want that in front of you as we are reading today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into our analysis of the first six stanzas of The Raven, beginning with form. So you're gonna see then in just first glance that we've broken down our poem into stanzas and we know on a minimum level that each stanza then has six lines to it. And this is something that continues throughout the poem. And this is important because in that way, I can designate it or distinguish it from other types of stanza-based poems that I know. So for example, it's definitely not a sonnet because each of these stanzas is not a quatrain, but in fact contains more verses. But I also gave you a hint last time that this poem type is called a narrative poem. And I told you then that the way in which we read is going to be similar to how we read fiction work. And the first thing then that I need to make sure that I do is understand the poem on a basic summary level. So do I comprehend what's happening? So I'm gonna go through each stanza and make sure that I can give just a brief summary of what in fact is going on. So I see in the beginning that my narrator finds themselves alone in the middle of the night and they're reading these strange stories when all of a sudden they hear a strange tapping at their door. But on first glance, they think that perhaps it's just some visitor. Then we continue and we find out that it's not just happening at night, but in the second stanza, it's revealed that this night is in December. So not only am I thinking of something dark, but also now something cold. We all know the weather is cold in December. Additionally, I know that he is busy reading and he's doing that because he's trying to forget the loss of his lover, Lenore. Finally then on this last stanza on the page, I see that he begins to hear these strange sounds and movements and he becomes uncomfortable in that he repeats that the strange sound surely is just a visitor and he does that in a sense to help calm him down. So from the get-go, I realize that something is off. Not everything is as it seems and I, as the reader, just like my narrator, feel very tense. The next thing that I'm going to want to do because I am discussing form is to look and determine what the meter of the poem is. So in completing Scansian, the very first thing that I need to do then is to divide my verses into their separate syllables. I've done that for you above. And I'm going to see then that through this one verse, I have broken down my syllables into 16. The next thing then I'm going to want to do is think about when I read this, which syllables are more pronounced, meaning which ones are stressed, versus which ones seem to fall away as I speak them, meaning they are unstressed. Let's try. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary. And one of the things that you should notice if you're listening carefully is that the sound being made at the beginning of each of these pairs of syllables, so if I'm breaking it down by each two syllables combining to create one type of foot, that beginning is stress, the opposite of the type of foot I'm familiar with, iambic. And this is because we've come across now a new type of foot called trochaic trochaic meter. And this is in fact the exact opposite of iambic pentameter. 
or iambic any meter for that matter. So when I'm talking about this verse, for example, once, this word is stressed. And then I see that it's followed up by an unstressed, uh, and this continues. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary. And this type of meter is very, very good in the type of atmosphere that Poe is trying to create because automatically you should feel ill at ease, some sort of tension. And that is because trochaic meter, unlike iambic meter, which follows the natural pattern of speech, goes against that. So it's kind of like creating that nails on a chalkboard feeling or listening to the recording backwards. Something is off and eerie. The next thing that I do when I'm determining form then is turn from meter to my rhyme scheme. And I'm going to go through and designate a letter, like I already know how, to the end of each of these verses based on this sound that's produced. And I quickly begin to see that in each of these stanzas, the first and the third lines are the only ones that do not rhyme with one another, meaning that the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth lines throughout the entirety of the poem all rhyme with one another with that oor sound. And the sound, by the way, that's being repeated is not repeated on accident. This is purposeful, right? That oor sound, again, combining with my trochaic meter to put me ill at ease. However, I'm not done discussing rhyme quite yet because I'm going to look at each of those lines that do not rhyme with one another, the first and the third line of each of my stanzas. And in reading, I find something interesting. Let's take the first verse, for example. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. Dreary and weary rhyme with one another. And I know that this type of rhyme is called internal rhyme. And I see then that this pattern is not just created with the first verse, but also with the third. While I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping. So although I have a consistent rhyme scheme, I also have a consistent internal rhyme scheme. And you see it here repeated in the second stanza, as well as the third. So Poe's poem, The Raven, is particularly beautiful for the tense atmosphere it creates with these multiple layers of rhyme. So, in summary, I have been introduced to the exposition of my narrative. So I understand who my character is, so this narrator, all alone at night. I understand the setting, that not only is it the middle of the evening, midnight, that haunting hour, but also it's in the middle of winter, December, and that something has happened, these noises are being made to put him ill at ease. I then am going to make sure that I fully understand my rhyme scheme and my meter, because these rhyme schemes and meters don't hold true to the entirety of the poem if they are not repeated. So after I'm done with each set of stanzas, I'm going to make sure that these schemes and meters that I have determined do in fact repeat to form a pattern. And the first thing I determined in looking at these first three stanzas is that the rhyme scheme A, B, C, B, B, B is repeated. So those certain lines always rhyme with one another. But on top of this, I also have internal rhyme. And this exists in each of the unrhymed verses, so the first and the third. So even when I do not seem to have an overall rhyme scheme, including these first and third verses, meaning they do not fall into that repetitive or sound, they rhyme with something within itself. I also see that I've created a specific type of meter called trochaic meter. Note that because I had 16 syllables, and that I already know a trochaic foot is created with two syllables, I then have eight feet in my verse, meaning I have trochaic octameter. 
So just remember, an easy way to remember trochaic meter is the, is the exact opposite of iambic. You can think of it as the evil twin, right? Because not only is it a switched or reverse of that iambic meter, it has the purpose of creating that tense and uncomfortable feeling versus the happy and pleasant feeling created usually with iambic meter. I then am going to repeat the same process with the next three stanzas I'm looking at because again I need to understand the story being told but also the form being created. So the story continues with my narrator finally gaining courage to go and speak to whoever is knocking at the door. But when they open it, they find no one there. Then they look out into the darkness and they begin to call out and they call out to their dead lover, maybe thinking that her ghost has come to haunt him. And somehow that name is echoed back to him obviously freaked out like all of us would be or should be, he runs back into the room terrified and he's trying to convince himself that there's some logical explanation for what's happening to him. Perhaps there is just some noise from the outside on the window, not in fact at the door. The next thing I do is double check my meter. Do I still have that trochaic meter being repeated? The simplest way to check that, again, is to do scansion, break it down into my syllables. I see again I have 16, just like I did before. And again, it repeats this pattern of stressed, unstressed. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Okay? So again, this repetition of that tense, uncomfortable meter. The next thing I do is double check my rhyme scheme is it repeated. And I find out that in fact, it is. My second, fourth, fifth, and sixth verses rhyme together with that or sound. Also, I have the repetition of my internal rhyme in my first and third verses. Stronger, longer, napping, rapping. And this is continued not just in the second stanza, but also in the, wait, it's not. And remember, what did I always tell you guys about this disruption of rhyme scheme? Even with internal rhyme scheme, it's important. Yes, I have the continuation of that or sound, but this is why I can't ignore that second layer of rhyme. And so I'm going to ask myself, why does Poe deviate away from that internal rhyme? Running and burning don't rhyme with one another. Something and lattice don't rhyme with one another. What might he be trying to tell me? And that's a question I'm going to bring up again when I analyze this with my literary devices. So keep stanza number six in the back of your mind. So again, my exposition continues. And now I have this inciting incident, going out and finding no one. And this is going to kickstart all of the action that I see in the rest of the poem. I also have double checked my rhyme scheme. And although it continues, I have that internal rhyme breaking in the sixth stanza. And that being a huge note for me to pay attention to that particular stanza when I begin to analyze for literary devices for deeper meaning. I also see that my meter continues, that trochaic octameter. So the tension being continued throughout the other stanzas I'm seeing. So again, just brief analytical takeaways. I have the exposition of the narrative poem being given. I have a consistent rhyme scheme with a slight internal rhyme deviation that we'll touch on in a moment. And this trochaic octameter, which as a falling meter, meaning it begins with stressed and ends unstressed, helps to create an atmosphere of fear and tension. I then am going to move on to literary devices. So I'm doing the same process now and I've color coded it for you on the right to make it easier to see. But all of these sound devices I'm picking out are going to combine with the rhyme scheme and the internal rhyme that I've already seen to give this 
flow to the poem that makes it one not just more pleasant to read but also lulls me into perhaps this false sense of security while the meter works in this undertone to build up that tension in me so I see several examples of alliteration remember that initial repetition of either a consonant or a vowel I also see assonance created, that repetition of those vowel sounds that occurs anywhere in the poem itself. Additionally, I also see consonants, the repetition of the middle or the final sound of those consonant letters. And on top of that, I even have onomatopoeia, so those words whose very sound represents its meaning. So this should be hitting you home very clearly that not only is Poe using a plethora of different types of rhyme, but he's also utilizing sound devices to help give a musical quality and a haunting mystical quality to the sound of his poem. Then I'm going to turn to my literary devices now. So moving away from sound devices, particularly to figurative language. And the first thing I'm going to start with is imagery. And I've highlighted all of these examples because they have something in common. Take a look and see if you can see what I see. All of these words, again, help create that ill feeling within me. Midnight dreary, forgotten lore, lore meaning those mysterious and somewhat dark folk tales that you hear. Think of uh, the Grimm brothers. You have things such as dying embers and ghosts, uncertain terrors and sorrow. So the imagery shouldn't leave you feeling happy. Something that is already being stated with the rhyme scheme and the meter. I also see personification in the items around him. So when I see this discussion of the purple curtain ruffling and moving, it's this sad, uncertain rustling, which we all know curtains as inanimate objects shouldn't feel anything. So even the very room around him has this sad, sorrowful quality. I also see simile being used, this tapping that my narrator hears at the door. It's as of someone gently rapping, giving the impression that perhaps he is unsure that someone is really even at the door in the first place. We also have metaphor here when he sees these dying embers. So embers, those last sparks or coals in a fire, rot its ghost upon the floor. And so here he's just describing the shadow that's being played on the floor from the dying of the fire, but done in a way where he describes this shadow like a ghost a ghost who he also feels might be at his door. We also see use of repetition. And here it's important because this repetition is really him trying to convince himself that yes, even though it's the middle of the night, in the middle of winter, when you wouldn't possibly have had a visitor at the door, that must be what it is, trying to secure himself, right? And we also have something new called euphemism. And euphemism is a type of figurative language where we use language to soften the actual meaning of something. And we, we say this a lot, particularly when we talk about death, because death is such an uncomfortable and sad topic. So when he says, for the lost Lenore, it's not that he's literally lost her and he cannot find her. It is, in fact, that she is dead. Then I'm going to jump to my last three stanzas for today. And I see again this repetition, not just of alliteration, but also of assonance, consonance, and again, onomatopoeia. So Poe is not going to disregard sound devices anywhere in this poem. And it's going to, in, in a sense, double the tension we already feel because the meter should be putting us ill at ease. But all of these sound devices create this free flowing rhythm 
to the poem, which stands at odds to that tension that we feel. So again, just like in a narrative, when we are reaching our way from the rising action towards the climax, the tension within us as the reader is also building. I then turn again to my literary devices, specifically figurative language. And I see, again, heavy use of imagery and that this imagery continues to have that dark and ominous feeling to it. This state of darkness, doubting, with fear and silence, mysterious whispering. None of this should be making you think of happy Disney tales, right? So again, getting this classic melancholic ominous feeling that Poe gives in his work. I see a continuation and an enhancing of personification. So everything in the room around him is coming alive, things that shouldn't be, right? So the first one is not so bad, right? His soul is growing stronger. So again, he is trying to bolster himself into a place of courage, but the things around him just as they are doing with us, make him feel uneasy, right? Look in this second stanza on this page that the stillness gave no token. So a token meaning a sign, but stillness is not alive. It shouldn't be giving anything. Additionally, you have echoes murmuring back or mumbling back that word of his lover, Lenore. Again, an echo shouldn't be able to speak. So, is it really the silence speaking to him, or something else, more ominous, speaking back? And then the second and last new figurative language device that I will present to you for today is hyperbole. And that's simply an over-exaggeration. So here, when he's thinking about what on earth this could possibly be that's going on, he says that he begins to dream dreams that no mortal ever dared to dream before. And so this exaggeration to emphasize the fact that the things that he are, is thinking are very, very deep and out of this world and again should put us ill at ease. So again, just a few analytical takeaways before we wrap up today's video. We have this working of both the sound devices and figurative language to create not just a sorrowful, melancholic tone and mood to the poem, but also one that feels strangely off-putting. Because although this consistent rhyme scheme should create this free-flowing feel to the poem, the types of sounds repeated and the meter that's used, that ill at ease meter creates within us this feeling of tension. So that's going to be it for today. For part three, we're going to continue with looking just at the next six stanzas. So stanza seven through 11. Please do make sure that you go ahead and download worksheet uh, number 14 for that next video, which I will post along with the video's link. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.